Good morning from Washington. Uh, thank you all for joining us for today's Tandem's information session, co-sponsored by Talent Care and the Global Community Liaison Office, or GCLO. My name is Carl Fox. I'm the department's Talent Care Coordinator. I'm pleased to be joined today by a panel of experts on an array of subjects related to the Tandem experience from GTM's Office of Career Developments and Assignments and Employee Relations Work-Life Division and GCLO. I want to thank the many of you who submitted questions through Slido last week. You have given our experts a great deal to respond to. They will try to cover as much material as they can in the time we have. We will also reserve some time at the end for questions and comments that you may submit through the WebEx chat today. Before we begin today's discussions, I'm honored to welcome Director General Carol Perez to give some introductory remarks. Director General, the floor is yours. Well, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us uh, for this uh, information session. Um, as Carl noted, this is a joint effort between his work uh, with the Talent Care Council and our GCO office, which is our, obviously, everyone knows our Global Community Liaison Office. Uh, Tandem issues are really important to the organization. I'm a former Tandem and I understand very much and very personally what it's like to try to navigate a career when uh, both of you are working either for the Foreign Service or sometimes for the Foreign Service and other agencies and how complicated that can be. And I can tell you it wasn't um, easy when I went through it. Um, and I know that it continues to have challenges today. So what's really terrific is that we have great experts here, as Carl mentioned, Carl and his team have put together the experts who are going to be able to answer your questions. And this is about uh, listening to you and then also making sure that uh, we can uh, respond uh, to the questions that you, uh, you sent to us. And thank you again for putting so many of those into our Slido last week. Uh, so, as um, I noted, Talent Care and GTM are doing this together. Uh, as you know, GCLO is the office that works on family member issues across the globe. Uh, and family member employment is one of the big issues, but tandem issues also fall uh, into an area in which they have a lot of ex uh, expertise and a lot of interest. Talent Care is, some, is a program that we started in 2020. We're delighted that Carl's been able to join us as the talent care coordinator for the department. Uh, this is really a whole of agency effort. We have a uh, talent care council, has senior level uh, leadership on it, includes global talent management, medical services, diplomatic security, consular affairs, regional bureaus, uh, Bureau of Administration, Ombudsman, Office of Civil Rights, uh, among others in the Foreign Service Institute. And the whole idea is to make sure that we are doing everything we can to support our employees. And I think that's incredibly important as we uh, continue to come out of uh, the pandemic and as we also, in, at least in Washington, D.C., are returning to the workplace. Uh, so there's uh, so much going on in that space, and I really do encourage you to uh, take advantage of all of the uh, wonderful programs and uh, support that is offered through Talent Care. Uh, and again, thanks to Carl and his team for doing that. So tandems, uh, tandems in fact are a growing part of our population. Um, some years ago it was 9%, it's up to about 14% of the, of the workforce now. Um, so it is growing and of course, as the size of the foreign service grows, that number continues to grow as well. And, uh, you know, we have all sorts of different types of tandems. So, you know, back in the day, it was most likely a foreign service officer to foreign service officer, but now our tandems include other agencies, uh, civilians from other agencies. So it's really become uh, quite, uh, different from what we had maybe even 10 years ago. So as you'll hear from our panelists today, the department is, re, uh, is undertaking a number of new initiatives to provide more flexibilities for tandems. Um, this includes expanding our DETO programs, our domestic telework overseas program, and there are now over 100 active DETOs. Uh, and that is an increase of 100% since 2020. So we really made uh, a lot of progress. A lot of work still to be done, but a lot of progress. Uh, and so with that, let me turn this back over to the panel. And I want to note that next week, May 4th, the Talent Care Council members are will participate in a listening session on tandems. And this will be another opportunity for you to speak directly to bureau leaders about your ideas and concerns related to employment as a tandem. We really do want to hear from you. Uh, and so thank you for attending and thank you for your contributions. Now let me turn it back over to Carl. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. I will now turn to our expert facilitator, Christina Stokes, to introduce, start the introductions of the panel and the questions and answers. Thank you. Over to you, Christina. 
Thank you, Carl. Uh, hello and good afternoon to everyone joining us today. My name is Christina Stokes and I'm the Deputy Director for Entry Level Specialists. I'm a Human Resources Officer and a tandem as well. In my role as Entry Level Deputy, we're responsible for guiding the careers of first and second tour Foreign Service employees. I have several tandem officers on my team and we all work together to help uh, our Foreign Service Entry Level Specialists navigate the sometimes complicated tandem process. Jeff, over to you. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Jeff Lockshus. I'm the tandem coordinator and a career development officer on the entry level generalist team. Uh, in the tandem coordinator role, I am a subject matter expert uh, for the CDOs on tandem issues, as well as a resource for general information uh, on EL tandems for all of our clients. Most tandems will not work directly with me. They'll work with their respective CDOs, but when there's any issue that requires a deep dive or more clarity on a policy related to tandems, uh, I'll work with the CDO to get that information to the client. And now I'll pass it off to Sandra. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Sandra McCarthy, and I am the tandem coordinator for tenured employees in CDA. And although I am not a CDO and I don't have clients assigned to me, I do work very closely with tenured foreign service tandems, and I provide guidance on alternatives available to them so that they can keep their families together. And I also coordinate the approval of foreign service dedos, and I process all the undynepotism reviews for foreign service tandems. Um, uh, personally, I am an HR specialist. I've been with the State Department for 17 years. I'm also a tandem, and I am currently on a DEDO working from Monrovia, Liberia. So if my internet is a bit slow, I do apologize, but it's part of the place where we live. Uh, and now I'm turning it over to Jim. My name is Jim Jomek. I am the Department of State's subject matter expert on everything to do with remote work, including DETOs. Uh, I, before I started this role about a year ago, I was in uh, CAEX for many, many years where I was the telework coordinator, uh, awards coordinator, and also the dental coordinator uh, there. So uh, I work in the uh, work life division of GTM employee relations, uh, where we primarily focused on uh, uh, policy of surrounding dentos, telework, and remote work. Now I'll pass it over to my colleague, Lauren Geeter. Thanks, Jim. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Lauren Geeter, and I joined the Work Life Division in 2020. I'm a part of Jim's telework team and also a member of the Leave Policy team in WLD. I'm also a civil service deto um, coming to you from uh, Ankara, Turkey right now. On the telework side, I focus on domestic remote work and on the deto program. And uh, you know, as, as um, all of you know, these and other workplace flexibilities have grown enormously. Uh, over the past few years, which has certainly expanded opportunities for the community, but also frankly revealed some uh, challenges and problems as well. So Jim and I are in the process of making revisions to both of those FAM chapters over the next 12 months or so, that's the goal. And so I, we, we really appreciate the chance to hear from everybody today, hopefully address some questions and concerns and just look forward together to the next phase of these programs. And um, Mary Beth, over to you. Thanks, Lauren. Hi, I'm Mary Beth Hunter, the Support Services Officer at GCLO. Our office advocates on behalf of tandem couples by answering incoming questions. We offer confidential guidance. We share resources that would include our website. Um, and our website covers topics such as serving unaccompanied, personal preparedness, and even evacuations. And we connect clients with contacts that GCLO maintains with folks right here in DC. So for instance, collaborating with Talent Care to produce a webinar like this is a good example. And we push out information via the worldwide community liaison office coordinators or CLOs. Some other examples include um, having our GCLO unaccompanied tours teams resources, such as the decision tree tool that guides families through options while serving separated. Our GCLO evacuations expert will experts will help tandem employees or with or without children kind of try to th think through some of the contingency plans that they need to think through if one employee leaves post while the other one remains. 
our GCLO support services team, that's the team that I work on, can connect you to PCS analysts in the International Domestic Support Division, or IDSD. And those folks can help provide answers that you need to sort out some of the logistical details and paperwork that you'll need to fill out. Our GCLO EFM employment team can help clients understand that foreign service specialists and generalists on leave without pay while accompanying their tandem spouse overseas, they can apply to work inside the mission. And now that's that's it for the GCLO side. It's time for me to pass it back to Christina, who is going to guide us through the question and answer portion of this session. Go ahead, Christina. Thank you, Mary Beth, and thank you, panel. Before we kick it off, I'm going to ask that Sandra um, tell us all what the official definition of tandem is. Sandra? So the department official definition for tandem is a member, um, a career or career candidate foreign service employee whose spouse or domestic partner is a career or career candidate foreign service employee of one of the five foreign affairs agencies. That includes Department of State, USAID, Department of Commerce, Department of Agriculture, and the U.S. Agency for Global Media. So that is the official definition of a tandem. Back to you. Great. Thank you, Sandra. Um, the first question is actually for you. Can you tell us what options are available to tandems as they move up through the ranks, especially considering nepotism issues? Uh, thank you. So uh, this is a follow on question from our tandem bidding seminar that we had last Wednesday. And during that seminar, we discussed many strategies to consider that are available to tandems, to tenured tandems. Um, some of them include the Cohen rule, which allows tandems to synchronize their transfer dates to the same bidding cycle. Uh, the Muller rule, which allows tandems to study together at FSI as long as certain criteria is met. Um, and also uh, DEDOs, uh, which allow a spouse to telework their domestic position from an overseas location. Um, there's also leave without pay, of course. Um, but there's also other strategies that we discuss. And again, every case is different. So you have to be creative and figure out what works best for you. But um, some of the options, options available are to consider down stretches, especially because promotion panels do not really know uh, the grade of the position. And who will be the lead bidder on a particular bidding cycle and then alternating the next cycle. So for example, if one spouse um, is the lead bidder in, in one cycle, maybe because they already uh, got promoted, so then the other spouse can, can lead at that, that time. And then a little bit about nepotism. Um, keep in mind that nepotism is it's a legal law and we in State Department mo must observe uh, these regulations and, uh, and sometimes workarounds are not feasible. But I assure you that CDA works very closely with L to find arrangements that are viable so that uh, tandems can uh, work together at the same post. Um, but there are many, many issues to consider um, so, as in all HR related concerns, it depends. It depends on the size of the post. It depends on the supervisory chain of command. It depends on the duties. So, it, it's, there's a lot of different things that need to be considered. But um, again, we try to analyze every case to ensure that there is a workable angle within the regulations. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. This next next question is for Lauren. Lauren, can you explain why DEDOs are not eligible for certain benefits like allowances, differentials, or home leave, even though they're overseas? 
Sure, Christina. Thanks. Thanks uh, for raising this. Is uh, we get. Um, a lot of variations of, of, of this question quite frequently. And with the small caveat that I don't want to speak for the allowances office, my understanding is that, you know, the eligibility for allowances and diffs and home leave, they are derived, they're based on an overseas assignment based on service at a post of duty abroad. And although dedos are, you know, teleworking from overseas, they're serving the department, the assignment itself, of course, is actually domestic and the location of the assignment turns out to be very powerful. So, with the exception, I believe, of the eight-year rule for continuous domestic assignment, and with the exception of overseas comparability pay, which foreign service debtors do receive, debtors are not considered to serve at a post of duty abroad as defined in the CFR. Um, and I know sometimes it can be quite frustrating for folks that they have kind of a split status, um, considered overseas for some um, and domestic for others. But that said, uh, I, I do want to mention that We've actually been asked by our leadership to look into the issue of home leave for dedos specifically. And so that is on our docket for this year. In fact, um, we are currently tackling one very specific aspect of the home leave issue as it relates to dedos. That is, we are working with L to see if there would be cases where deferrals, uh, home leave deferrals could be extended in cases where a tandem couple's tours, basically their end dates don't match up. So I want to be candid that these are preliminary discussions, and I can't certainly can't promise today what the outcome of those discussions will be. Um, but we've been approached by CDA. We're working with CDA, and we're consulting with L on on that possibility. And that would be sort of a starting point on the home leave issue. Thanks. Great, thank you, Lauren. This next question is also for you. Civil service dedos are not eligible for locality pay, which means they lose a large percentage of their salaries when teleworking overseas. This is a pay equity issue. Are there any efforts underway to address this? Yeah, so this is a pay equity issue and it's important to us. We are meeting every three weeks very regularly with an employee advocacy group. We are talking through and considering and researching and investigating many possible options. Unfortunately, it's not as simple as just restoring or granting locality pay. Federal pay regs are locality based. We have a locality based pay system. So they don't allow us to, to simply change our own minds and allow locality leave. So we're looking into other avenues, uh, meeting with a bunch of stakeholders in many parts of the department. Now, based on the conversations we've had so far, it may be that in the end, this will require a statutory solution. And as you all know, that has its own challenges and one of those challenges is how long it would take and frankly, you know, how difficult that might be. It would not be a quick fix as my understanding of us is not a quick fix for foreign service employees to receive um, overseas comparability pay. That was a multi-year effort in my understanding. So I, I want to reiterate that this issue is important to us, but I also think it's really important to understand that a change of this uh, magnitude would take time and include players and equities outside of the department as well, potentially. You know, I wish it were, but unfortunately, it's not something that we can just change in the FAM. So we're happy to keep the community posted, and people can always reach out to us on this issue um, at dedo, uh, dedo policy at state.gov. And frankly, people can reach out to us on any dedo related issue um, at dedo policy at state.gov. Thanks, Christina. Thank you, Lauren. Jim, this next question is for you. Can you tell us why do debt agreements take so long to get approved? Sure. Uh, we know it takes way too long for many debt arrangements to be approved. And in, in our minds, that's not okay. Uh, you have to keep in mind that every debt arrangement is different and the amount of time it takes to get approval can vary widely. Some of the factors that can affect the length of time to get to approval uh, can include if the DEDO requires an anti-nepotism review, which can add a substantial amount of time to the process. If the DEDO requires access to uh, a workspace within the embassy or consulate where ICAST funding would need to be uh, included. And also the, the actual duties of the position, which can affect uh, whether the employee can actually do their DEDO from a particular uh, post or or region, uh, they would have to, you know, 
that would have to be a, a much larger discussion within their bureau and their office to figure that out. Uh, since the beginning of 2022, we've had a number of meetings uh, with the DEDO process, what we're calling the DEDO process working group, uh, where we have met with the DEDO coordinators and other stakeholders to discuss different ways that we can uh, streamline the process to make, make it go faster. Uh, we have come up with some ideas and we will continue to work on those ideas at, at, during the year. Uh, one, one of the problems is that the demand for dedos has increased significantly, especially since two years ago, since the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, but there has been no commensurate rate uh, increase in the number of people who are actually processing the dedo arrangements. Uh, there are some offices that are understaffed that play a vital role in the dedo approval process. So we, as I said, we are working on ways to streamline the, the process but we just ask your patience uh, when you are applying for a DEDO and also to give yourself plenty of time in advance of when your sponsor will need to, you know, will PCS to that post uh, to ensure that you uh, have a you know, fully approved uh, DEDO agreement before, you know, when you arrive at post. But please keep in mind that you are not permitted to start to work on a DEDO agreement until all the I's are dotted T's are crossed. Uh, so that is a discussion to have with uh, your DEDO coordinator of your bureau, but also you can reach out to us at DEDO policy at state.gov if you have any questions about the process itself. Thank you. Christina. Thanks, Jim. Our next question is for Sandra. Can there be one definitive DEDO agreement and process? One person in CDA should be shepherding the process to include correct version, clearance, and tracking. Thank you. And this question was also asked in last week's tandem bidding webinar. And uh, I explained that as tandem coordinator, I work with bureaus and employees entering data arrangements to get approval for those foreign service data agreements. Um, one point I didn't mention uh, because we ran out of time was that although it is not a perfect system, and as Jim has mentioned, each bureau has a designated telework coordinator or data coordinator who is responsible for assisting both foreign service and civil service employees complete the data approval process. Um, you know, all bureaus have different ways of, of doing this and they have their own procedures. So I think it would be kind of difficult to have one person do it all. Uh, but we are certainly looking into ways to improve the, the data approval to make the entire process more palatable to everybody. And um, as standing coordinator in CDA specifically, I, I can tell you that I do my part to shepherd the, the process and to obtain all the approvals. Um, I ensure that all the data agreements are in compliance with data policies and I track the panel actions to ensure that um, employees are paneled quickly once everything is approved. And I also track the processing of the personnel actions to ensure that debtors do not continue to receive TC locality in error because they have to pay it back if they do. So I do all of that in collaboration with the uh, employees and the bureaus. And, you know, again, as, as Jim has mentioned, we're working together to figure out better ways to make this an easier and a faster process. So um, bear with us as we find that solution. Great. Thank you, Sandra. Um, the next question is for GTM EX, and I believe that our colleagues from that office are here and that Judy Semilota will answer this question. EX offices refuse to ship laptops to Dettos but posts get all or most electronics via pouch. Why not create guidance on these issues? Also, as a DEDO, I'm denied a laptop because I must remain cost neutral, yet other non-DEDOs in my office received laptops. How will the department manage this clear inequity going forward? Uh, thank you, this is a really great question. And um, based on this question, we started to circulate it around uh, EX. We've had some conversations um, 
right now the with the change from uh, IRM switching out desktops for laptops, it's a really smart question. Um, it is a matter of funding. And so we are looking into that and we're going to continue to work on it. Don't have any direct answer for you yet, but uh, we'll provide updates as we move along. Great, thank you, Judy. Lauren, this ne next question is for you. Why can't DEDOs do Y tours? Why prevent officers from being a value add to offices in need? Yeah, so this is this is a tough issue, frankly, and um, you know, especially for offices in need and for tandem employees who are on LWAP when they don't want to be on LWAP. But this is really policy direction that comes, you know, right from senior leadership. And I want to add a bit to amplify a bit how I addressed this in the morning session, and just to say that you know, Y tours are not assignments to positions. There's there's no FTE that underpins a Y tour, and by definition, it's really meant to be a temporary surge um, and in leadership's, in leadership's view you know assignments especially for those going overseas should be to positions and should not be for that kind of temporary work in addition another you know really key concern here that makes this tough is that the more people are on Y tours frankly the you know the more domestic assignments may go unfilled so it's a tough issue but that's that's where we are policy wise currently thanks thank you Lauren Sandra this next question is for you can the anti-nepotism review be a part of the DETO agreement process? Why not get all approvals at once? All others can just indicate NA if it doesn't apply. There's a point of clarification here that is important to make to be made. Um, an anti-nepotism review should only be needed if the sponsoring employee encumbering as is encumbering a specific position such as chief of mission deputy chief of mission consul general or principal officer or deputy principal officer because the nepotism sop allows a spouse to serve in an acting capacity um, for a period of 30 days in a calendar year so um, therefore, at least for foreign service, I can tell you that the majority of the debtors that, that we process do not require an anti-nepotism review. Um, and when they do, I, I try to work closely with the bureaus and do them concurrently, the debtor agreement and the anti-nepotism review so that we reduce processing time. Uh, but certainly we can do a better job at trying to do them at the same time. Thank you, Sandra. Mary Beth, this next question is for you. We combine these questions since they both touch on EFM employment. First, can you explain why tandems overseas on leave without pay as EFMs have a lower hiring preference in the EFM hiring process versus other EFMs? Also, why is it that foreign service generalists or specialists on leave without pay are not eligible for EPAP positions? Thanks, Christina. So to answer these questions, our team reached out to the Office of Overseas Employment, which is the office that holds the policy for family member employment. Um, and here, here's the answer that they provided. When the hiring preference policy was put into place, careful consideration was given to creating a fair and balanced approach to enhancing family member employment. So just so you know, family members face a lot of employment challenges related to their mobile lifestyle, including things like language requirements, budgetary constraints, the length of time required to obtain a security clearance, and potential lack of continuity in a position due to the, sponsor, the sponsors or sponsoring employees transfer schedule. Current employment policies balance the needs for our non-career foreign service family members with the needs of career foreign service employees who have made that very difficult choice of requesting leave without pay during an overseas tour. Regarding the inability of foreign service on leave without pay to apply for expanded professional associates positions or EPAP positions, and we're, we're looking into that and the requirement that only an AEFM may apply, know that we know about this restriction and we're working with the overseas employment team, retirement services, 
and other key stakeholders to determine if this is something that we can address in, in future cycles. Please, if you have any questions at all related to EFM employment, please reach out to our GCLO employment team at GCLO Ask Employment at state.gov. Thanks, Christina. Thank you. Sandra, this next question is for you. Non-tandems perceive in-country language training as unfair. What will the department do to ensure equity? Um, thank you. So uh, another point of clarification is that according to CDA's standard operating procedure on the in-country language program, um, I need to ensure that you understand that this is available to all tenured mid and senior level employees. It's not just tandems. Uh, tandem status is certainly not part of the eligibility requirement for participation uh, because all that is required is for an employee to have received and accepted a handshake on a language designated position at the post where the employee will study the language. Um, so, uh, we have a, a panel that reviews all the, the submissions and we have in the past approved uh, requests from non-tandems for family reasons. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Jeff, this next question is for you. Why is it difficult to get assignments together, especially entry level? Many are forced to choose between family and career and then choose to leave the department. Yeah, uh, in entry level, it can be a challenge for tandems to serve together. Uh, on both specialist and generalist side, CDA EL will make every reasonable effort to facilitate uh, tandem serving together, but there's never going to be a guarantee that that's possible. The assignments being directed in entry level must abide by EEO policies, and we can therefore not advantage or disadvantage anyone based on marital status. Now, that includes we can't pre-assign employees or reserve positions on the bid list for employees. We can't add positions on the bid list. We can't ask officers to leave post early or extend their stay to accommodate tandems. When we're making our assignments, the focus of the process is to give the best opportunities to each officer to fulfill their entry-level service requirements, get tenured, and get off language probation. In the case of those officers who have RLP obligations, the recruitment language program, we will facilitate getting an assignment for them that uses the language uh, with which they were hired. For these reasons, you often hear that the EL tandem, the entry-level tandem, always leads. Uh, this means the flexibilities that exist for tandems, whether it's Dedo or Muller Rule or Cohen Rule, they can only be taken advantage of by an officer who has already uh, satisfied their entry-level uh, service requirements, has already received tenure. That way, um, the way we look at it is the mid-level or senior level should be anticipating following the entry-level employee on their directed assignment. Now, there's an additional complication on the specialist side, as the specialist team does not own their entry-level positions and must request positions from the bureaus prior to each orientation class. This makes it very difficult to assign um, couples together, especially when we generally have so few positions in each specialty. So uh, altogether, tandems should weigh serving together against locations and jobs that they want, deciding what's most important for their family during each bid cycle and making their decisions accordingly. Uh, we would encourage all tandems to work together closely with their CDO to develop a realistic bidding strategy that maximizes the possibility of serving together or look at some of the options that might be available to fulfill entry-level service requirements earlier. All right, thank you. Great, thanks, Jeff. Jim, this next question is for you. Can you tell us how the MAT will impact supervisors' perspective on whether a job is DEDO eligible? Oh, Jim, I'm sorry, I think you're on mute. All right, thank you. Uh, I will also answer the next question as it is also MAT related right after this one. Yeah, the MAT or mobility assessment tool assesses to what extent a position's functions can be performed remotely, and in that way it informs the maximum telework level of the position. If the position's maximum telework level is less than 80%, the position generally isn't dental eligible because some of the duties require the employee to be at the work site to perform those duties. When duties, portfolios, or needs of the mission change, the supervisor can do a reassessment of, to determine the degree to which the functions can be worked off site. Traditionally, positions with at least 80% telework eligibility 
could be accommodated for debt or arrange our agreements by shifting duties within the office, resulting in colleagues picking up more in office or in person duties and the debt or gaining duties that could be done uh, completely in a remote posture. Hold on one second, please. Okay. Uh, the discussion about the MAT score should be part of the initial discussion that Deto and the supervisor have when first exploring the possibility of a Deto arrangement. I would note that in general, we don't recommend that too many duties uh, be shifted onto those, the staff that is back at, in Washington or at the home office, as that could certainly become unfair to those on site. The next question is, can MAT scores be displayed in talent map now that the department, uh, oh, I'm, I'm misreading it. Now that we have a talent map for employees to uh, look at when bidding, uh, managers are not required to list the MAT score, uh, but we do encourage them to do so if possible. Uh, it would definitely help bidders have a better sense of what jobs can be worked remotely and therefore might be feasible as debtors. Uh, but keep in mind that even with a 100% math score, there is no guarantee that the DETO is eligible or that they would receive approval um, because there are so many other factors that come into play when determining whether that could happen. So the best thing to do is have that discussion with the supervisor, as I said in the previous answer, to determine if they think your position would be eligible and could be approved for a DETO agreement. Christina? Um, Great, thanks, Jim. Sandra, this next question is for you. There were several questions about iMatch and how tandems will be considered if the pilot is expanded. Um, thank you. So um, iMatch is still a pilot program and we are currently planning for the second year of this pilot and we'll have announcements in the coming months um, on the expanded pool of iMatch participants. Um, so the idea is that when deployed, then a, the full functionality of iMatch would allow all tandems, regardless of skill code, to indicate their tandem status and ask the software to prioritize a match in the same city as their spouse. Um, but again, we are still, um, you know, piloting this and there will be um, more reports after the conclusion of the second year. And then our leadership will determine if, you know, what we're going to do moving forward as far as IMATCH is concerned. Thank you. Great, thanks, Sandra. Lauren, can you tell us, is it possible for a foreign service employee to work part-time under a DETO? Yeah, sure. So and hopefully this is a, uh, an easy one. Unfortunately, the language in the FAM is a little unclear on this. The way that the eligibility is stated is that, you know, the mention of part time, the mention of job sharing and so on is grouped together with disability. But uh, we've conferred with Elle and our sense is that that was um, inadvertent, frankly. And um, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to be opening up the Deto FAM, which is 3 FAM 2370. Um, I'm making a number of changes and uh, we will seek to clarify that language when we undertake this year's round of um, FAM edits. Thanks. Great, thanks Lauren. Jim, another question for you. Can you explain why all Dettos don't automatically receive blue badges at post? Sure, uh, we understand that some at some posts, DEDOs do receive blue badges, but then in other posts, they receive yellow badges. And we know that this can be very frustrating for many DEDOs around the world, uh, especially when you've been a, you're a career foreign service officer and you have a you know, more than top secret clearance and uh, you're getting a yellow badge because you're getting it as in your role as an EFM. Uh, we have spoken to diplomatic security about this but their stance is that their the discretion is left up to the individual regional security offices at the embassies or consulates around the world. Uh, and even though we've advocated for badges to correspond with the clearance level of the employee, in all actuality, DEDOs are EFMs at post and um, some RSOs take that literally and they give them the commensurate yellow badge to meet that. Uh, that level uh, of need for uh, security clearance need. Um, you know, we regret that we're not able to resolve this uh, issue, but we will continue to engage with DS to see if there's anything that 
we can do from uh, from our side to to uh, ensure that more consideration is given to dettos uh, going forward for their badges. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. Lauren, this next question is for you. With the State Department's emphasis on inclusivity, will it recognize same or opposite sex domestic partners for DETO or tandem eligibility? So, um, GTM ER owns the DETO policy, but we don't own the policy related to domestic partnerships themselves or to, you know, what employees are considered to be in a tandem couple. That said, um, we realize that at present domestic partners are not eligible for dettos, and we know this is affecting families in our community. We have taken the preliminary step of including this issue in the department's future of work um, workforce flexibilities plan to look into whether the department could consider domestic partners as eligible to be sponsoring employees for the purposes of dettos. So. Uh, it's a very complicated issue. There are privileges and immunities um, factors to be taken into consideration and, um, you know, we'll happy to provide updates, um, but it, it's again, we're just taking a preliminary look at this. So perhaps more to follow on that. Great. Thanks, Lauren. This next question is um, for GTMEX and I believe Lewis Thompson will be answering it. Lewis, can you tell us why are Dettos transferring back to DC with their tandem spouse? both ineligible for home service transfer allowance as an employee and as an EFM. Uh, good afternoon and good evening to uh, everyone. Uh, it all depends on the situation. So we have to look at those, look at uh, those requests on a case by case basis and determine at what stage the ditto is with their current assignment. So it just depends. Uh, it could be that the uh, PCS order that sent the individual to DC has expired. And if it has not expired, then, and they have not taken advantage of HSTA, then they will be able to take advantage of it. So it's just, it's all based off of a uh, case by case. And we have to review these, uh, these requests uh, individually. And one situation does not uh, pan out for everyone. So that's why, once the request is sent to our office, we can review and we can um, let you know the decision based off of the rules and regulations that we are governed by. Great, thanks, That's Lewis. It. Okay. This next question is an entry level question, and uh, I'll provide the answer. New OMS can defer assignments one time for two years. What happens after that if assignments still don't align? Are they terminated and or are there other consequences? So just to make a quick clarification, this is an option open to all candidates who are on the register. It's not an option once you have become an employee with the Department of State. So the registrar's office may process a one-time deferment not to exceed a maximum of 24 months based on specific criteria. So that specific criteria is if you're married to a Foreign Service employee currently assigned overseas, if you're a Peace Corps volunteer, if you're serving abroad on a Fulbright, Fulbright grant, if you're a U.S. government civilian employee serving abroad, if you'll be absent from duty due to pregnancy, childbirth, adoption, or foster care, if you're experiencing a serious health condition, or if you're performing service in a uniformed service consistent with the requirements of the Uniformed Services Employment and Reemployment Rights Act, that's the USERRA Act. If you have any additional questions about how to go through this process or who qualifies, please reach out to the Bureau of Global Talent Management, the Office of Talent and Acquisition, that's the TAC office, and they can help with any additional clarification or questions that you might have. This next question is for Lauren. Balancing family and career gets more difficult the higher you reach in the department and the larger a family gets. Given up or out structure in the Foreign Service, there's pressure to take on more responsibility right as family demands are at their highest. Can you comment on part-time options or other flexibilities? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think that, you know, the really good news here is that what we've all seen over the past two years is that, you know, really the past years have shown leadership, shown management, supervisors at, you know, all levels that really it's, it's very, very possible um, and often a good thing to be more open to, you know, part time work and job shares and flexible work schedules, you know, for their employees to help them balance their 
work responsibilities and their personal responsibilities. And, you know, for sure, telework and remote work uh, opportunities are expanding, particularly domestically, um, an enormous amount. And, you know, we're advocates, we're consistent advocates for these opportunities for employees. And I think we're making slow and steady progress in that regard, and we'll, we'll keep pushing. But for now, just on part-time in particular, um, that's really incumbent on the employee to work this out with their future supervisor when bidding. These are, you know, case by case arrangements. And, and honestly, that's really true for most workplace flexibilities. Yes, there are policies in place and we try to be as clear as possible about what the eligibilities are, but eligibility and approval are different. And so approvals are, you know, supervisors have discretion over approvals. And so most of these are worked out on a case by case basis. Thanks. Great, thank you, Lauren. This next question is for Sandra. Can Talent Map have the option to enter up to X amount of non-state locations in matching tandem positions for us interagency tandems to better sort our bids? So I'm, I'm not the uh, subject matter expert on Talent Map, but I did um, consult with the guru in CDA and I found out that Talent Map is a system specifically designed for the Department of State based on GTM CDA's bidding and assignments policies and procedures. Um, and since other agencies have their own bidding systems and their own timelines and cycles, it is really impossible for us to include information that pertains to other agencies into Talent Map at this time. Uh, that being said, Employees are always encouraged to seek the advice of their CDOs and their HR staff in their particular agencies to ensure that all options are available to tandems and properly applied for the particular case. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Sandra. Lauren, this next question is for you. Is it possible for a civil service employee to take leave without pay to accompany his foreign service spouse abroad? Yeah, so there's um, there's a pilot program now for um, extended leave without pay, extended LWOP program, and it's for both civil service and foreign service. And um, there's been you know several notices and and all docs about this. I think there may have even been an all doc um, in the last month that people could look at. I think that was publishing the results of the second year of the pilot program. Um, so I think the best thing to do would be to I, I believe for for civil service, I believe it's CSTEM. Um, that you'd want to reach out to for more information about extended LWAP. And then, you know, again, like all things, start having conversations with your office early about whether this would be feasible in your particular case. Great, Thanks. thank you. I have one more for you. Okay. Um, I'm a PD coned and current, I am PD coned and currently on a DETO. Post asked if I could help out on a high level visit as a TDY. My office said yes, but the DETO office said it would not be possible. Why is that? Wouldn't it make sense from a human resource perspective within the department to allow short term TDYs? So, yeah, I can certainly see, I you can certainly understand why that would seem like um, an illogical um, response from us, but it's, it's important to us to keep DEDOs and TDYs separate. They're separate programs. As I mentioned in a previous response to a different question, you know, DEDOs aren't assigned to post and they're not detailed to post and they're not notified as being diplomats to the host country. So it's important to keep DEDO roles and the work done at post separate. In fact, when you're applying to be a DEDO, one of the most important things to take note of is to ensure that your portfolio doesn't have any intersection with the host country where you're going. So um, I hope that's helpful. Yes, thank you. Um, I see that we have wrapped up our Slido questions, but we have a few minutes left. So I'm gonna move to some of the questions from today's chat. So Jim, this next one is for you. Uh, good morning and thank you for hosting this session. This may be a basic question, but are dettos limited to certain positions? Was that to me, Christina? I saw, I think I lost internet for a second there. Yes, it was. Let me know if you need me re to repeat it. Uh, no, I think I can get it. Um, hold on one second. Okay. Now, as long as the position can be performed remotely, it can be worked as a debtor. Uh, there are a number of factors to consider 
that need to be considered uh, and the prospective ghetto must have that discussion with their supervisor that I mentioned earlier when talking about the mat to determine if the ghetto arrangement could be something hold on, uh, could be something that the office would approve. One thing to take into consideration when thinking about a ghetto is that your portfolio cannot intersect with the the country that you're that you will be working from. So that is an important thing to consider when your sponsor is bidding on their next assignment. So um, again, if you have any questions about that, you can reach out to ghetto policy at state.gov and we'd be happy to discuss uh, any uh, possibilities with you. There you go. Thanks, Jim. Here's another one for you. Can you tell us what the average processing time for ghetto agreements is at the moment? Uh, there's really no way to give you an accurate uh, time frame for getting a ghetto agreement approved uh, because each ghetto arrangement, each ghetto request is is unique. Uh, they all have their own. Uh, complexities and the more complex your debt arrangement will be, uh, it, it'll lengthen the amount of time that it will take to get the, uh, the approval for the debt agreement. Uh, some of the issues that would lengthen that time I already brought up earlier in the discussion would be if you need access to a workspace uh, or if you require an ANR. So these are all things to consider when you are uh, starting the ghetto process, but we say that the minimum it'll take is about three months, but that would be a very, very quick turnaround. I would say anywhere between three and six months is reasonable to get these, uh, get a ghetto approved. So please, if you can start the process early and have all of your documents uh, lined up and accurate before you submit them. Okay, I'm out. Great, thank you, Jim. Sandra, I know you were having some technical difficulties, but I think you're back on with us. This question is for you. Good morning and thank you for your time. What are the opportunities and flexibilities available for tandems if one is a tenured officer and the other is an ELO on a directed assignment? I love this question. And I have a lot of resources available. Um, first of all, tandem coordinator, and my partner in crime, um, Jeff, um, you can send a message to tandem coordinator at state.gov. We have a tandem teams channel available with lots of information. Um, last year, I, I sent a cable called helpful hints for tandem bidding. So that's also available. SOP A11A talks about tandem assignments. And if there's one thing that I can I should encourage every entry level or any tandem uh, is to read and be very familiar with that um, SOP because it, it specifies the coin rule, what is the Mueller rule, what is uh, Detto, you know, all the options available to tenured employees. So um, discover all of those options. And if you need help, just send a message to send the coordinator at state.gov and I'll be happy to point you in the right direction. Great, thank you, Sandra. It looks like we have two more questions that I'm gonna direct to you. And then I think we'll be wrapping it up um, just in the interest of time. So this next question for USAID state tandems on the same bidding cycle, how, do the bidding processes align and what contacts should be made before beginning the process? I am a first tour USAID foreign service officer spouse is third tour state. Um, so USAID has a tandem coordinator. Her name is Pam Foster. And, um, you know, we have been discussing how to implement uh, tandem, um, uh, you know, resources for both AID and state. So I encourage you to, to reach out to her. And I understand that USAID also has an entry level uh, coordinator that assists uh, in the same role as a CDO like, like we have in state. So I encourage you to, to reach out to those people in USAID. Of course, also keep your state CDO aware of what you're doing so that hopefully we can align all the stars and, uh, and you can keep your family together. Great, thanks, Sandra. The last one for you. 
Are the Cohen and Moller rules specific to state foreign service officers, or are they part of the FAM and apply to FSOs or other agencies as well? I.e., could a non-state foreign service officer invoke one of these rules and point to FAM for applicability? My understanding is that it is for state uh, tandems only because these are SOPs for CDA. Um, however, you know, again, I encourage you to to contact the tandem coordinator in USAID if that's who you work for or your HR person and show them the State Department regulations and see if they will be willing to work with you and implement something similar. But as of as of now, my understanding is that it is only for state. Great. Thank you, Sandra. Carl, we are going to be passing it back to you to close out the session. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Christina. And an enormous thanks to all of our panelists for your considered and comprehensive responses. Um, and uh, I also want to give a big thanks to our behind the scenes crew uh, from GCLO for uh, making sure that all of this works and uh, working through multiple time zones and uh, getting getting us live to all of you around the world. With that, I'm going to say an enormous thank you to everybody and wish you all a great morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. Thanks all.